And I just want to welcome everybody this morning to the continuation of our dairy webinar series here at the University of Vermont. And today um, we are joined by Dr. Marcia Andres. Oh, sorry, Marcia. <laughs> this is very, this is perfect. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, um, and she's joining us today from the University of Minnesota. She's in the Department of Animal Sciences there. And we heard from so many folks um, that we work with here in Vermont and around the Northeast about, you know, people needing to transition to, to lose housing systems. Many of the dairy uh, buyers are requiring people to get the cows out of the tie stalls. Uh, with deadlines. I'm sure it's the same in Minnesota with some of the farms there. And our farmers are, you know, looking for some options. Of course, with the price of milk and the economy, it's been really hard to even think about putting up any kind of new structure. And we reached out to Dr. Andres and she agreed to come and try to share some of the information she's been gathering over the years on loose housing systems, in particular bedded packs. Um, and so we are really happy to have you with us today. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm pleased to be here with you today. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about loose housing systems. So um, we, we decided today to talk about uh, loose housing systems, and I add a little bit in parentheses here that I'll be focusing primarily on the compost bedded pack system. Um, that, there's a picture here from actually a, a barn that I visited in Brazil and was doing a field day in Brazil. They had 300 people on the field day, which was incredible to me. But anyway, uh, so you can see that it is a, is a bed pack where cows can be uh, free to move anywhere they want, right? So before we talk about the bed packs, uh, I want us to take a step back and think about something else first. And that's about sustainability in the dairy industry or uh, dairy sector and on a dairy farm. So of course we have economics that play here for sustainability. We need to have a profitable farms and a profitable sector. Um, so again, when you talk about moving from a different type of housing system to let's say bad packs or, or loose housing, we need to look at the costs of course and make sure that is something we can afford. Um, there is environmental issues that play into sustainability overall. And as we talk about housing systems, we wanna make sure that we, we're no, not affecting negatively you know, air quality, water quality, um, that our dairy farms you know, have some biodiversity, et cetera, different aspects of greenhouse gases and in free efficiency of milk production and so on that contribute to that. But I think what's affecting uh, this change in Vermont and maybe not as, as, as big here yet, uh, Heather, in terms of getting away from tie stalls, but I see that's going to be our future. Um, it has a lot to do with the social sustainability, right? How the, the public, the general, general public or the consumers um, see our dairy uh, farm practices. And they are, um, interested in animal welfare, um, how the lives of the animals under our care, how good those lives are. So we go back to the animal welfare um, criteria here or areas of emphasis that I'd like to share with you today too, that was basically put together by Dr. Fraser at the University of British Columbia. But you look at these three main areas that we uh, need to focus on when we think about animal welfare, which again is within that social sustainability sphere, um, we, as veterinarians um, and maybe farmers too, we tend to focus a lot on the basic health and functioning of the animal. Uh, we want to make sure the animal is performing, um, the animal is healthy, uh, has good body condition, um, that we don't have a lot of on-farm mortality, etc. And that's, of course, very important for animal welfare. But I think the public tends to go and look into this area of natural living a little more because the basic health for them is a given. We have to provide that. Um, natural living, especially as, as it relates to have the ability to express natural behaviors, um, have the ability to socialize. And that's one thing, of course, that tie stalls um, make it more difficult for cows to socialize, of course. And that's one thing that is innate um, behavior on cows because cows are herd animals, so, and calves too. Uh, so that natural living becomes part of the 
the um, animal welfare uh, needs, if you will, for the animal, along with the affective state of the animal. And that would be more the mental state, um, how contented they are, how comfortable they are, and uh, free from negative, any sort of negative stress as much as possible. Um, so these are things we need to keep in mind when we are designing our housing systems too, because they affect uh, potentially all of these areas. So today we're going to be talking about loose housing. Before I move into compost barns, I want to share with you some efforts going on, especially in Europe, looking at things like artificial floors. Uh, this is a picture I took at the research um, farm, at the Wageningen uh, University Research Farm, where they built these artificial floors that are basically a type of loose housing system where cows have the ability to go anywhere uh, and move freely in this better pack, excuse me, in this artificial floor pack. And um, it allows them to use maybe robot systems that vacuum the manure, uh, et cetera. They are not completely, uh, no, not very common at all. They're not really um, very high adoption yet. Um, but we do have also some of these other loose housing systems in Europe um, that I got this picture here from a colleague in, in Israel that I work with over the years, showing the ability of animals to really rest and relax in these type of bedded pack systems here. And also bedded packs exist in Israel. Uh, they call them cultivated packs. And they are able to actually put all the, the manure um, back into these packs in Israel um, by having about 200 square feet per cow, so they're huge. And 95% of cows in Israel now are housed in systems like this. So as I just want to give a little perspective, um, a little more broadly than just the US for you to have an idea. But coming back to the US, we tend to have more what's called a compost bedded pack system. And I want to just kind of describe briefly what this looks like. So if you think about a freestyle system, uh, on the bottom left corner here, a very comfortable barn with a deep bedded sand, the best type of bedding uh, for freestyle barns, uh, well ventilated, uh, naturally ventilated in this case, cows are comfortable, etc. But if, and then it, that's how you feed them on the right picture here, um, you have a feed bunk and cows can freely access the bunk at any time. So this is a type of loose housing, if you will, cows can freely move around. A little more expensive to build because you have to have you know, the, the concrete to build these type of barns here, the, the stalls, the loops. I mean, it's kind of an expensive system to build. So the idea the producers had here uh, started kind of in Minnesota was to maybe replace. So this is a diagram that Kevin Young and Kevin Yanni, engineer I work with here, put together for us. So let's say you took off the stalls and now you put a, a short uh, four feet concrete wall around that bed pack area, separating that bed pack area from the feed lane. And then you add bed, no, bedding here. Most of the time we use something like sawdust. And you wanna have, and over the years we increased this number. Um, we came to the conclusion that for our conditions in the US, we need at least 100, 110 square feet per cow, not, not 85 like we initially had taught um, in the beginning of our studies back in the early 2000s. We are more into higher you know, amount of space, a greater amount of space per cow now. Even greater than this might be beneficial. So let's say this is a resting area. We have then the water troughs that will be uh, placed in on the concrete space here, the feed lane, not in the bed of pack because that could make, um, cause a lot of moisture here to happen. So we put them in this part of the barn. And then we have to have walkways for the cows to go through and access the pack. And we wanna have at least two spaces like this so cows can get in um, because cows tend to be very hierarchical. So if you have only one entrance area in your bed of pack, you might have a dominant cow blocking the entry, and that could be really bad because cows need to rest. Very important for them to have 12 hours of rest, and they need to be able to access this um, resting area. So anyway, um, so the compost barn system and the name uh, originated from uh, the Portner Brothers in Minnesota, Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. 
Tom and Mark um, had a old freestyle barn um, in their farm uh, that they didn't, they're not very happy with the comfort, let's just say, of that old freestyle. And I, they decided that what if we could put cows in a more open system that would allow them to um, rest, get off concrete. Uh, they had a lot of lameness in their farm. And they had read an article, I think it was from Virginia, where there's some grazing dairies in Virginia that during the winter time, they were experimenting with this idea of having a bed of sawdust that they cultivated um, twice, a, twice a day to um, keep it fresh, if you will. But they're not using it uh, for, for the entire year. They're just using it in the winter. And there was very few, like one farm or two. Uh, so Tom uh, decided that what if we use this kind of system to confine our cows for the entire year? And they started with this barn. So this is the very first barn that was built in 2001. And the fall 2001, cows moved into this barn. Very simple build, um, overhang here. Cows are fed on the outside. And Oh, excuse me, let me go back here. So back in, in that, uh, during that time, I was just, I started university basically in 2002. So this was just going on at the time and there were not many barns. And I had a colleague next door to me, Dr. Jeff Renault, who, who was an expert in, um, in mastitis. He's uh, an emeritus professor now. Uh, he retired a few years ago, but he was very concerned about the fact that this particular farm um, was putting cows in a bed pack because he was more familiar with the traditional bedded pack uh, with long straw, um, where cows are in an in a, in a anaerobic system, a lot of growth of mastitis pathogens, and we have a lot of mastitis. And he was very concerned, actually, very concerned. So for about four years or so, people start visiting this farm. And we had a, a certain number of dairies, uh, about 12 or so farms that adopted uh, this system. And so in 2005, uh, we were able to publish some papers uh, with the research we did with those pioneer dairies that had adopted better packs. And then in 2007, we had our compost barn conference where we, um, we had people from about 10 different countries come in and join us. And with the power of the internet, I would say the, the idea of the compost bedded pack spread worldwide. And I would have uh, people visiting um, from different parts of the world. Um, we had uh, basically uh, calls and, and so on from probably 25, 30 different countries over the years uh, with people interested in bedded packs. In 2012, the first barn was built in Brazil, and Brazil probably has the, the largest number of bedded packs at about 2,500 to 3,000 farms in Minnesota now, have, excuse me, <laughs> in Brazil now, have uh, adopted the bedded pack uh, compost barn system. So it has been a trajectory um, uh, in that direction. We do not have as many in Minnesota anymore, actually. But I'll talk about that later, why we don't have as many of them. So some of the advantages of compost bed back barns, again, this is the partner's dairy inside of that very first barn. You can see the fans that are blowing air on the cows. This is summertime, lots of bedding here, lots of bedding. So you keep adding bedding, you don't remove the bedding until fall. So you're going to have a lot of bedding accumulating. Uh, so it becomes a way to store manure for a portion of the year where you're putting manure in here and you're collecting the manure from the feed alley. And that's about 30, 35% of the manure goes in here as cows are eating. And that gets scraped to a storage system uh, like a lagoon or a small lagoon that you can spread in the fields. And then this solid material here, uh, most of it is removed out in the fall, I would say around October, and then can be spread in the fields and then some of it stays be behind to start the new pack in the fall. So usually around October, uh, farmers will bring new bedding, clean bedding, um, but you want to have a little bit of that old bedding to basically inoculate, if you will, the new bedding. So you start that composting um, a process. So that's why the name came, uh, compost barns. We, it's not a true compost that you get out of this. You have a composting process going on as you're adding manure every day it's really hard to have a full 
composting going on in order to complete the process. You have to take it out of the barn and really compost further if you want to have a true compost. But the idea of composting is that it's generating heat and that heat that's generated from the composting process will help dry the pack. So we'll talk more about that in a minute, about that too. So when we talk about the spheres of animal welfare and we talk about natural behavior being important and the affective state being important for cows, um, this system allows cows to express natural resting positions very easily. As you can see in this picture, you have cows lying down in different directions. Some of them are together in groups. Some are more by themselves. There's a lot of grooming that we observe positive interactions between cows that can happen very easily. Uh, if a dominant cow comes around, it's easy for a more submissive animal to get up and get away from her because she doesn't have stalls to deal with. So it really most likely also improves their affective state, meaning their stress level uh, probably goes down in this kind of system. So this is um, one important aspect of cow comfort or uh, animal welfare that these type of systems provide compared to even free stalls, I would say. Free stalls, of course, better than tie stalls in terms of natural behavior expression. Uh, but these are even beyond that because you have this ability to move around freely and to interact with other cows and so on. Uh, you, again, this is a, I call the dead cow position. <laughs> uh, a lot of times I go to better pack systems like this and we're going to see a few cows that do this and they do this for a few minutes a day. But it's very easy to do, express this kind of behavior in, in this kind of systems than it is like again on tie stalls or free stalls. So cows are very comfortable. Uh, this is when they're in deep sleep and they're really resting. And actually a study done in Europe by Blanco Peñedo uh, recently uh, showed that what they call free walk systems, which would be primarily compost bedded packs in Europe like this, or some of those artificial floors that I showed earlier, they see that cows are more uh, able to express some of the natural positions in those systems than in free stalls. Uh, so there was a significant difference, especially for the long position and the wide position um, that cows can express in these systems. Uh, one thing that we've seen and other colleagues uh, in the US and, and Europe have also seen is that the feet and leg health uh, in better packs is improved. So this is just one example of one of our studies where we uh, compared compost barns with a deep bedded, free, deep bedded sand freestyle systems, either mechanically ventilated, which is CV here, cross ventilated, or naturally ventilated. So I would say the cross ventilated, deep bedded freestyle system is the best for cow comfort of the freestyles that you can find in the US. So very comfortable, um, deep bedded sand is comfortable, helps cows walk in the alleys, it's not slippery, etc. But even comparing the compost barn with the best type, excuse me, the best type of freestyle system, we still saw a significant advantage in leg health, looking at hawks for the better packs compared to the freestyle. So you see here the very few cows had severe swollen lesions like these, and actually even uh, very few cows had more mild lesions like hair loss like this. Uh, and this was done over a period of a year, um, going to these farms every uh, I think it was every month or a couple of months that we scored uh, basically every cow in these barns. So uh, throughout this, this um, study, we scored 47,500 cows. So it's a, a large data set where we see this advantage uh, again for the leg health. We also saw an advantage for lameness prevalence, again, compared to the best type of sand-based freestyle at the time. This was a few years ago. But we still see this kind of um, prevalence of lameness in farms today, about 15%, uh, even in freestyle systems, uh, with the better packs being about 6%. So again, an advantage of food health that we see consistently across studies um, Again, not just our studies, but studies in Kentucky. Uh, University of Kentucky has done quite a few studies also in better pack systems like this. Also colleagues in Europe uh, found similar um, findings where uh, less lameness prevalence in better packs. One concern we had, and I mentioned earlier, 
okay, we're bedding cows, basically manure. Of course, we're cultivating the manure. We're trying to keep it dry. But at the end of the day, it's a very organic material that promotes growth of bacteria. And so there's a big concern about milk quality. What's going to happen to milk quality when we put them in these types of systems? This is a picture here of a uh, retrofitted um, barn. And they, this is where the tie stall used to be. They you know, built a swing system here, swing parlor system on this farm where they uh, milk their cows now. So the cows, uh, they built a freestall barn, excuse me, a compost bedded pack barn. And then they use the tie stall uh, as the holding pan and then the parlor here. Uh, this farm consistently consistently has around, I'd say 120, 150,000 somatic cell counts. So we collected data from the farms to see uh, how the transition between um, going from tie stall to bedded packs, uh, how that influenced the incidence of subclinical mastitis. This is basic data, CHIA data before and after. And interesting enough, we found that about two thirds of, two -thirds of the farms actually had a reduction in um, subclinical mastitis in spite of the high bacterial counts in the bedding. Uh, overall, however, as we did um, studies over time, we don't find an advantage um, for bedded pack systems. I would say that if they're well managed, you're going to have a similar milk quality. You're not going to have necessarily better somatic cell count numbers. You're going to have similar to free stalls. So I don't want to misrepresent the system here and say that's going to be better than free stalls. I don't think so. I think you're going to be able to achieve similar. Um, milk quality numbers, uh, not necessarily better. But this study that was in the beginning where we transitioned some of these farms, at the time we did see actually a positive response here of two thirds of the farms, which was interesting. Again, we expect to find the opposite, um, which made my colleague um, be a little more receptive, if you will, to this type of system compared to a traditional bedded pack with straw, where he always saw very high uh, bacterial counts and high cell counts. So I think maybe that cultivating the pack and increasing the temperature might help um, with um, making uh, these systems a little less uh, susceptible to high somatic cell counts. And also the stress level of the cows um, might be lower. So they might be able to fight infections a little bit better. So the immune system of those cows might be able to handle that high bacterial count a little bit better because they are under lower stress. Studies done by Favreau et al. here showed that this, the mastitis risk, this is um, done in a series of farms. I believe they had, I can't recall from the top of my head, maybe eight to 10 different farms where they actually collected information, more detailed information about mastitis and they cultured mastitis cases, et cetera. And they found that there was an increase in mastitis of about 6% for each unit increase in bedding moisture content. So very important to try to keep that pack well managed and keep the moisture, um, I would say below 60% if you can, because that of course has apparently a direct, correl a direct correlation with mastitis incidence. And also, of course, that is this relationship with mastitis and cleanliness of the cows. So we want to make sure cows um, are clean and these go hand in hand. As moisture content increases in the better pack, the dirtiness of the cow also increases. So the, the, the hygiene of the cows is a good metric for you to look at um, to indicate to you that the pack is not you know, up to par, it's not doing very well because it's too wet and it's sticking to the cows that with farmers, usually that's what they tell me is like, oh, the bedding starts to stick to the cows. I know it's, it's too wet and I need to put more bedding because um, my cows are going to start getting dirty. Uh, so we really have to be on top of it. Um, it's, it takes a little different type of management because it's not like just putting bedding on a freestall and then cleaning the back of the freestall at every milking. You have to really pay attention to the pack and make sure it's not getting too dirty um, and too wet. So that's something that takes a different type of manager. And it, so it's not necessarily super easy, but if you can do it well, you can reduce uh, your mastitis incidence. So very important to maintain the aeration of the pack, very fluffy, uh, very soft, um, 
don't want to have a lot of manure uh, piles in it. You want to drive through it and uh, be able to keep it clean. Uh, this farm is a little bit of a, how can I say, um, is a farm that also has access to pasture. So obviously um, cows are not in the pack all day long. So that helps this particular farm to keep it cleaner. Uh, cows have a free access to pasture. It was interesting for me to see that when it got to be a little hot in the afternoon, uh, even before milking time, I'll, I'll say around 2 p.m. or so, 1, 2 p.m., cows start coming to the pack on their own. They wanna be here. Um, they wanna be, and, and you know, in the shade here, um, the soft pack, and then they go to get milked. And then after they get milked, uh, it was interesting to note also that most of the animals preferred to sleep in the barn. Um, maybe they felt more protected. I don't know, more protected from the environment or feels a little more protection from potential predators like you know, cows are prey animals so that the environment here feels more protected. So these farm actually had free access to pasture, um, which is interesting. Um, cultivation can be done at different types of, of things like the you know, cultivator here on this particular farm. You can see that they have these uh, around the tires to reduce compaction. And this is something they didn't do right away. And once they did this, they really like it because it says it compacts the pack a lot less. Um, so this is interesting. Producers learn by doing. Uh, so this is what they're using now. Um, I had a farm that had one of these very deep Till, um, tillers, I guess they call these things, where once a day he would use a, a deeper tilling and then once a day he would do a little less deep. And he told me that going deep was good to uh, add more air to the pack. And by adding more air, he was generating um, a little more composting um, to happen. And that helped keep the temperature high, even in the wintertime. This particular farm uh, was able to keep pack temperatures, even in the winter time, at about 120 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is unusual. Most of our farms go down to about 60, 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter time. I have a farm here that normally uses a rototiller. And for some reason on this farm, it works really well. Uh, this farm has averages usually about 100 pounds of milk per cow, um, 90,000 somatic cell counts. So it's interesting how, um, there is no specific formula sometimes. Uh, farmers learn on their own what's the best for their own farm and they make it work. So it, it just takes a little art, if you will, to make these systems work. This is a, what they use in the, in the, you know, it's a little different. This is uh, that farm in Brazil I showed um, maybe earlier when the cow was sleeping. Uh, they are pulling something behind. It's kind of like a cultivator too, but it also levels it, see? So there is a cultivator and then there's thing that levels the, the bedding. And this bedding here was interesting too for me. Um, they started, instead of with sawdust, uh, they were near a peanut plant, I guess, and they were able to get a lot of peanut shells. So they started their pack with peanut shells. Uh, the peanut shells got trampled by the cows over time and the particle size got smaller and smaller. Um, and when I visit this facility here, there, I think it was 11 months ago, is when they put the bedding here 11 months ago. So they just by cultivating and drying the manure with these big fans here, they were able to have a very nice, um, clean, kind of clean pack, if you will. Cows are really clean uh, just by cultivating twice a day and having a lot of air moving through to dry it up. You can see this is after they stir. This, this is like a little more um, chunky, if you will, yet before they actually cultivate it. Um, and they had a shorter wall. Uh, they don't have as high of a wall around the pack. It's only about uh, probably, I would say a couple of feet actually um, on the other side because the pack really goes down. So different climate than Minnesota and Vermont, of course. So we can do things differently. Uh, we do measure the bed pack temperatures. This is in the, not the surface, but you go deep about, uh, I'd say, uh, like a foot or so, um, and then you take a, you know, maybe a foot and a half and you take a compost thermometer uh, that has a stem, you go down, I would say, yeah, probably a foot and a half to two feet, and then you measure the temperature. You wanted the temperature at that two feet uh, uh, you know, below the surface 
to be uh, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which indicates that we're having a composting process happening. Um, the surface temperature is very similar to the ambient temperature because we have fans that are um, cooling the surface of the pack. Uh, so this is the one study we did. We can see the variability from farm to farm. Some farms were able to have very high temperatures. Some were a little bit cooler here. This is during the summer. But this is a metric we can use uh, just to verify that the composting is happening. And that helps generate uh, heat that helps dry the pack. So the idea is helping dry the pack, not that we're going to have a full composting process uh, to be completed in the pack. It's not going to happen in the pack, but by having this temperature gauge, we know that there's heat being generated and helps dry the pack. What's ideal? Not sure. Uh, hasn't been re much research to prove the point, if you will, that we need to have high temperatures, but maybe again, around that 100 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit would be a good temperature to, to have. So what we notice again, what we learned over the years um, from our studies, studies from colleagues in the US and Europe and, and South America, also from producers um, experiences, if you will, we think that the factors that influence uh, bedding quality include particle size. Um, so the smaller, the better actually. Um, the water absorption capacity of that bedding material and the water holding capacity of that bedding material. And that's why sawdust is so good. Uh, sawdust is really dry when you start with. It has really good water absorption capacity. And then once it absorbs that manure, it keeps it in. It doesn't burst open like corn stalks do and release the moisture back to the pack. It keeps it in. Uh, Tom Portner likes to refer to the sawdust as a diaper, like a diaper holds it in, holds that moisture in, and it, it's the best option. We've had other bedding types being um, tested. Some people make it work with mixtures of sawdust plus something else, like maybe ground soybean straw. Um, some people have used rice straw. Uh, we had people using, in other places like California, almond almond uh, shells. I mentioned earlier the peanut shells. Um, there's some studies done in Europe looking at some type of grasses that are very uh, high in lignin, um, like elephant grass that can be grown for bedding and sh shredded very small uh, to be used for bedding. Um, we had also an experiment where we used some wood chips, very small wood chips. Uh, they were really good. Uh, they work really well, especially um, by themselves and also mixed with sawdust. Uh, corn cobs, of course, really hard to, hard to find corn cobs, but we did an experiment where corn cobs were really good bedding in terms of providing um, a, 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 our water absorption capacity and everything. It just it smelled really bad. So I don't recommend that because it, the smell was not good. <laughs> My colleague that was collaborating with me on that study said, it smelled like Limburger cheese. Whatever Limburger cheese is, and I actually bought some of it just to see. To tell the truth, I don't like the smell of that. I couldn't eat the thing. Anyway, sorry, one, just one type of cheese. Of all the cheeses I eat, it's the only one I never really liked. But anyway, there's a taste for everything. So that was some of the baddings we looked at. Uh, the number of cows per square feet is very important. We don't want to overcrowd um, because it's kind of like, um, you might think if I have more cows in in an area, I'm going to need less bedding because I have a smaller area. Interesting enough, it's the opposite. If you have more space, the bedding stays cleaner and lasts longer for you, and the cows are cleaner, and you have less mastitis, and you have less problems by having more space, even though cows are not necessarily spread all over the entirety of that space. So what happens is that they congregate, congregate in certain areas of the pack. The edges of the pack sometimes stay a little bit drier. So you can kind of mix it back in and help dry the pack. And at the end of the year too, in the fall, when you take material out, you can kind of save a little more of the drier portions of it if you want to start a new pack and so on. So having the space is very key. So please do not go below 100, 120 square feet per cow. The aeration frequency is important, especially for your milking cows. You want to do it at least twice a day as cows go to the parlor so you can milk them uh, during that time. And then it takes you five, 10 minutes to go with the equipment over the pack and, and mix it up and aerate it and make sure you have that 
composting happening. And the depth, you wanna go at least a foot, hopefully uh, depth um, to get it mixed in. Ventilation is very key, not only for cooling cows in the summer, but also important uh, to ventilate the barn and remove the moisture that's generated with this composting process. So even in the winter time, you wanna figure out a way that you can open your curtains for a little bit to get the moist, moist air out and then close them back. So that way you remove the moisture from the back, right? So ventilation with fans, run them for a little bit, just a few minutes in the winter to get rid of the moisture and then you can turn them off, but make sure that you have good ventilation in the barn. Um, some of the indicators, indicators we can use to make sure the bedding quality is good will be the temperature that we talked about and the moisture content that we talked about again earlier. So about the 55, 60% would be ideal. I would not like to go over 65%. Uh, fans, very important. Again, you can see this is a very open barn, right? But they still have these 72 inch fans here that blow a lot of air on top of the pack to remove the moisture. And of course, in our world in Vermont and Minnesota, the ventilation becomes even more important because we do have very moist um, periods of time, like in, this, in the winter time, in the springtime, early springtime, that were most difficult to manage the bed pack because we have a lot of moisture accumulating and it's hard to get rid of it. Um, so it's more challenging for us to manage bed packs than it is in other parts of the world. This is a, a farm in Minnesota. They are grazing dairy, organic. Um, they have two Lely Laurel bots and they house their cows in the winter in this bed pack system that they do manage as a compost pack. So cows go out to the parlor, excuse me, to the robots to be milked. And they come here with the equipment to a mix twice a day. And they just go slowly and cows move out of the way and then makes them get up and go to, um, to the robots. Um, we're looking at about 60 cows here. Um, per robots, about 120 cows or so, 110 cows on this farm. And then the summer, they're primarily outside um, on the pasture, but they do have access to the pack if they want to. So again, based on some of the experiment, experience we've had and research that we've done, what's important to make these compost barns work? We wanna have an excellent management of that bedding pack itself without overcrowding. We wanna have very good barn ventilation Ideal in east-west barn orientation, because then, uh, especially if it's a naturally ventilated barn, you don't have one side of the barn getting really hot, let's say in the afternoon, for example, and cows start bunching and so on. So we wanna have uh, preferably a east-west barn orientation. Uh, open ridge, high side walls, um, 16 feet side walls, because you have the four feet wall around it, you wanna have your side walls really high to really ventilate this barn and really make uh, a lot of um, opportunity for a lot of that moist uh, air to get out. Um, wide eaves to protect the feed bunk. If you have like a, a three row barn kind of system, make sure you have wide eaves that protect the pack and protect the feed bunk if it's a feed bunk is on the outside and so on. And have many entrances from the feed alley to the bed of pack, like a minimum of two, uh, depending on the size of your pack. If you have a big one, have at least three entrances. If you have a smaller pack, have a couple of entrances. So the, again, I said earlier, a dominant cow does not um, cause uh, basically an obstruction to other animals that want to get into the pack area. We also wanna make sure that the waterers, the water troughs are outside of the bed of pack area, not inside. So we don't make, do not make the bedding wet. Um, the bedding material that we talk about, particle size, water absorption capacity, water holding capacity, a dry material. So those are things you need to find in your area that might be available to you that you can experiment with that might be an appropriate bedding material. We want to aerate it at least twice a day for your milking cows. For your dry cows, you could probably get by with once a day aeration because they don't produce as much manure. Um, when, when we prep cows during milking, very, very, very important that we prep them really well because they are lying down on a bed pack that is full of environmental mastitis pathogens. So we wanna make sure we clean the teats really good. We clean the teat ends very well. So we remove those environmental pathogens from the teat ends so that we have a clean cow that gets milked. And very important because cows are in this environment that might have a lot of coliforms. We want to vaccinate your cows for coliform mastitis. 
I had a farm, um, Compost Better Pack Farm, um, that transitioned to a new parlor. Uh, the parlor was not very well adjusted. They didn't know that. And it started causing some teeth and damage. And the cows go back to the pack. Of course, the pack does have coliforms. And they lost, this is 100 cow dairy. They lost 15 cows to toxic mastitis. Um, that was very bad. Um, so they were not at the time for some reason yet vaccinating with the J5 or JVAC or some coliform mastitis vaccine. Um, they start doing so. Of course, they fixed the parlor. t dens got better. So they haven't lost a cow since then, as far as I know. Uh, but it was uh, really a wake up call um, that we need to vaccinate these animals to reduce the more severe types um, cases, the more severe cases of mastitis. So keep that in mind. If you move into a better pack, uh, make sure your coliform vaccination is up to date. So in summary, I would say that compost barns can be a viable alternative to freestyle barns as a loose housing system. They take a bit of management, instead of ma especially management of the bed pack itself, but they can work. Uh, the benefits include cow comfort, a better lag and food health, and the ability for the cows to express more natural behaviors, which is important to the public. If you look at these things here, these are big aspects of your social sustainability. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, compost barns can help with manure management at the farm, and they uh, need to have excellent pack management, of course, for success. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I tried to keep this not super long so we can have a discussion, hopefully, and um, any questions you might have. Um, and that's it for, for the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you. That was great information. It was neat to see so many different systems from, from different places around the world. So thanks for sharing all of that. Sure. Um, if anybody has a question, can type it in the chat. All right, Sarah is asking, um, can you say anything about the annual bedding cost? Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thanks for the question because that is the negative. So uh, unfortunately the bedding costs and availability was what drove the, basically stopped the growth of bedding pack systems here in Minnesota. So if you look at the cost of bedding for, let's say, sand-based freestyle barns, we look at approximately maybe 9 to 15 cents per cow per day, okay? Um, maybe mattress-based systems where you're putting some organic bedding, maybe around 30, 40 cents per cow per day. The bedding pack system, because of the cost of sawdust for us here in Minnesota, was around 80, to 80 cents to a dollar per cow per day. So a lot higher bedding costs. Um, so that was one of the negatives um, that drove, again, um, farm, farmers here not to continue to adopt the system. And not only the cost, um, we were competing here in Minnesota with the St. Paul uh, power plant <laughs> of all places that was getting a lot of the sawdust uh, in the country, in the state, excuse me, um, and uh, paying a good price for it. So that drove the price of sawdust higher and higher and higher. We're paying up to $2,000 per load of sawdust, uh, semi-truck load. Um, so it was getting really expensive. Um, it, that's a limitation of the system. So we need to figure out if there's anything else that you have available um, in your area that might be a little less expensive that you could use as bedding because that, that drove the, the system down basically. Uh, question here about species of tree. So we've, we've we looked at all different types, uh, you know, hardwoods and then softwoods like pine. Um, they all can work. Uh, the one that works the best at least in terms of what we saw in terms of somatic cell count and things like that was actually pine, pine sawdust, which I was surprised, but it's a soft wood, right? Uh, but the pine sawdust um, was um, the better one. We've had some people here using um, dust from cabinet making. So of course, there'll be all kinds of wood um, and that worked okay. Um, we've had some people using uh, ground up pallets, uh, not so great um, because sometimes there are glues and things in it that were not very good for composting. So you have to pay attention what else is in that bedding when you buy it to make sure it's not contaminated uh, with better uh, with things that are not good for for uh, for composting. Uh, cedar uh, wood, cedar cheap chips, uh, cedar has an antimicrobial in it. Uh, so cedar 
is really bad um, because you're not going to get any composting. I actually, in the beginning of our studies, we went to a farm that was using cedar, cedar sawdust or cedar chips, and that uh, was horrible. It was like, um, how can I say it in a nice way? It was really a manure pack. It was wet. It was cows were super dirty, um, and they were also overcrowding. Uh, needless to say, that barn didn't last more than a year. Uh, they came, they, they got out of business. Um, it, it's unfortunate because they had to do with the bedding they were using and the overcrowding. They could have solved that problem uh, by just changing the bedding material and selling cows and having less cows. Um, so anyway, keep that in mind. Um, Insulated well ventilated barn versus a hoop or cold barn. Um, any barn better than another bedding user performance. So insulated well ventilated barns. Uh, we didn't have a lot of those in the research studies that we've done. Others have done, so it's hard to compare. Uh, most of the barns we've had, um, both here in Kentucky and in in, uh, in in other places, have been uh, natural ventilated, more open barns. They are not, uh, you know, mechanically ventilated, if you will. So that makes it hard to compare. Um, I would think that uh, there might be, as long as you can remove the moisture, again, the important thing is to remove that moisture that is going to be generated as, you, uh, as you're cultivating the pack. So if you have enough uh, good uh, ventilation to enough air movement, if you will, seven to eight to 10 miles per hour wind that can move that out of the barn, it might work well, but we do not have data to tell you that would be better, okay? So I don't wanna say that it's better without having data. Um, so we don't have the opportunity to test for that. Information on using shredded cardboard or paper. Please do not use paper. Uh, paper, unfortunately, does not have the structure and the water absorption capacity. Maybe it has some of the absorption capacity, but definitely does not have the structure that we need uh, to maintain that moisture in. So it would be like, corn stalks, when we grind corn stalks and we tested that, and basically the corn stalks will absorb that moisture initially, but then they don't hold it and they burst open basically and release, release that moisture back into the pack. And now you have a manure pack, uh, really messy, really dirty. It's unfortunate that we cannot use it because it'll be a cheap source for some people. If you can use um, as a component of a mixture where you have some sawdust, and then some paper, maybe it would work. Um, you by volume, maybe you want to have at least fifty percent of that being the sawdust. I would say fifty to seventy percent, and then a little bit of, could be the cardboard. So you just saving a little bit on sawdust, but then the sawdust is adding the structure. Hopefully, that might work, but we're not able to test that directly as a mixture. We tested what is it by itself. And then there was a colleague here that did a lot of composting uh, testing for us uh, in, in more of an artificial testing system here, but it was to mimic what would happen in the barn. And the cardboard and the paper came uh, one of the worst ones, along with corn stalks and things like that. Uh, information about shredded. Uh, what else do you need to take into account in terms of your orientation of the barn in a better pack? I said east, east west for heat, yes. Uh, other reasons? Um, well, uh, I think prevailing winds are important. So maybe that might not work for everyone. If you want to have a natural ventilated barn, you might be better off doing something in a different direction. Um, but it was more because of the heat abatement aspect of it. Uh, what if it's not oriented that way because you are accounting for wind rows to make sure that the we smell, the odor is not so high because tourists visit the farm. You know, what's one thing interesting about better packs is that the smell on these barns is so much better. Um, we've brought, brought some people here too. We have a little compost barn on campus and it's... Um, not the ideal bad pack, but it works okay. And we brought this lady. She was a, I think she was a, I don't know, a reporter from the New York Times or something. I mean, something really not not dairy related at all. And she goes in the bad pack. And she goes, "Wow, it smells so nice in here." Um, it doesn't smell as bad. I think because it's composting, it seems to help with the smell a little bit too. I'm not saying it's going to be zero smell, but it's definitely better. Um, so I wouldn't be as worried about that. Um, but yeah, I think it was more because of the heat abatement that I mentioned east-west. Um, when you say a dollar per cow per day for bedding costs, what is the actual volume used? A per day cost is variable depending on trail load per se cost. Okay, I have to think back, but I think we were using 30 pounds of bedding per cow per year, but don't quote me on that. I'll have to go back and look, but I think it was 30 pounds uh, per cow per year. 
of bedding that we needed to use to do that calculation. And the trailer load was uh, 1,800 pounds that we're looking at when we talk about that cost. Excuse me, $1,800, 18 tons, excuse me, 18 tons per load. So big, big semi-trucks. Yeah, I was curious. Um, it, I'm just checking for more questions, but I was wondering, you know, you definitely said don't use straw or hay, but it seems like a lot of dairies have grass. And I know, you know, have used that mm -hmm. traditionally for bedding. Right. So when we did a mixture of the straw with the sawdust, that worked a little bit better because, again, that adds a little bit more of that structure that we're looking for. Right. Um, and then we did a study uh, later on with farms that were using different types of bedding, if you will. And a lot of those farms were using uh, mixtures because they, ha they had their own soybean straw, for example, or some other sort yeah. of straw. And what happened, even on those farms, we followed those farms for like a year and a half. And when sawdust was available and they could get it for a good price, they switched to sawdust immediately. It's just so much easier to, to, to actually manage, I think. Um, but they were able to make it work with those mixtures and make, make it work with some other types of, of bedding. There's a farm in South Dakota that actually has been using rye straw because they, they get rye straw from uh, all the neighbors, kind of. Um, mm -hmm. And they've been using that successfully by itself. And I think it has huh? something to do with the ventilation, uh, the space per cow. They don't overcrowd them. They have a lot of space per cow. And then at the end of the day, what they do, they actually, because they work with the neighbors, they bring them manure back to the farm. Um, you know, the, the, the straw uh, after it being composted uh, in the pack goes back to the farms as, as a source of fertilizer. So they have yeah. some, some kind of thing going with those uh, collaborators around them. Um, so that works for, so I guess my experience has been that it's almost, if there is a bedding that you think has good structure uh, that absorbs water well and, and holds it, it's, it's kind of a good idea to maybe do a little experimentation, if you will, and uh, see if it works for you because it might work, right? Uh, yeah. I, think, I think sawdust is just easier. So people tend to go in that direction because it's so much easier to manage and, and, and more foolproof, if you will. The other bedding sources might be a little more difficult to manage. Like we started with soy straw, soy straw in one of our studies and we didn't chop it small enough um and that was bad <laughs> because it was bridging like creating the chunks like mm. chunks of bedding so we had to invest on a like a grinder a tub grinder and grind it down to like uh probably an inch long like very small so after we ground it very small um we're able to use that soy straw for bedding a lot better so that's another thing you need to keep in mind if you're going to use your own straw you need to really have a tub grinder or something so it's a piece of equipment that we paid $60,000 for, whatever it was, I don't remember, it was expensive. But anyway, we had to buy the piece of equipment in order to grind the straw to make sure it was small enough to be cultivated every day. Because when it's too big, it doesn't allow you to cultivate, it just bridges more. So once we ground it smaller, we were able to at least do a little better job of mixing it. And that made a big difference. So there's all these little details that almost takes time to learn. You know, I almost have to experiment um, and see how it works for you. So it's really hard to, for me to give you just a recipe, if you will. Like, because, yeah. and every state is a little different. Like, they can get by with things in Kentucky that we cannot in Minnesota. Because you know Kentucky has a little bit different climate, doesn't get as cold as Minnesota. They have a a, a longer, um, warmer season than we do, and the warmer seasons are easiest for these type of bedding because it dries a little bit better, right? So they they grew more. I mean, they have more barns in Kentucky now than we do in Minnesota because it just worked better for them. It was easier to manage down there. I think Vermont and Minnesota struggle a little bit more because of the bedding situation. It's a little trickier to do. Yes, absolutely. Additional resources for us to help farmers plan for the volume and cost of the bedding if they need to uh, design these bars. I have to look into it if I have any sort of a um, more detailed um, volume for the different beddings that we had. Um, I'll have to dig into it. It's been a little while that I did that study. So it's been great. I've learned so much. So thank you, oh, thank so you. much <laughs> for the presentation today. And it was sure. great to see all the research that you folks have done over the years. And I, I, um, 
I think you used to have some resources on the Minnesota website. They're probably still there on Bedded Packs. Yeah, I hope so. What happens is that the University of Minnesota Extension decided to revamp the uh, web. Yep. I know. And we lost a lot. <laughs> we lost right. a lot of stuff. So I don't even know if that's still in there. Hopefully it is. And we also had an e-extension article that Kevin and I wrote a few years ago. I don't think a lot changed except for the bedding. Um, right you know, the space per cow, which I don't agree that we should go as low as 85. I mean, based on my experience over the years, I don't think that's a good thing. So that might be soon that article, which I should talk with the extension to update that maybe. Anyway, there might be yeah. a way to update that. But anyway, some of the other aspects on that article might still be okay. Um, still, you know, work. So anyway. Great. 